This video covers bonds and their valuation. It's chapter 7. Now let me give you a little context into bonds. Um, you can look at them from two different angles. Uh, one angle would be that you're an investor and you want to buy a bond. And you buy the bond, you put it in your portfolio, and when you do that, you have, you know, look at your balance sheet, you have assets, you have liabilities, and you have equity. What you've done is you, you've taken your cash and you reduced it, say, by, let's say you buy a bond for $1,000. You reduce it for $1,000, and then you, you basically flip it into a bond, and so your bond account goes up by $1,000. Okay? It's an asset from the investor's point of view. Okay? Now, that's, that's one angle. The other angle would be, and this is the angle we're mainly going to look at in this course, is, look, if you bought, if you bought a bond, somebody had to issue the bond. Somebody had to sell the bond and create the bond. That's where we're looking. That's the angle we're looking at from in this course. We're looking at as a bond, as debt. And so, the com a company may issue a one thousand dollar bond, okay, and then that money ends up going as cash for a thousand dollars. So they issue the bond. It funds the assets. So this whole side of the balance sheet, we call funds this side of the balance sheet. So they issue debt. It, they, it immediately get cash from investors, people like you and I, um, who, who invest, who will ultimately invest for our retirement. And then what the um, company will do is they'll convert, they'll drop this, they'll get rid of the cash, and they'll buy property, plant, and equipment, or a building, or you know, machinery, uh, they'll build out a product line, and they'll invest that, that cash and generate some income off it, just like when you as an investor generate income when you buy the bond. So when these companies issue bonds here, they're paying interest expense, right? And the cash flow that comes off of the investment from their investment in property, plant, and equipment will help pay off the, the $1,000 back in the future and will pay off any interest expense that's, that's demanded for that bond. Okay, so the context is mainly this. We're looking at it from the company's perspective. It's issuing debt. It's, it immediately turns into cash. The company will flip that cash over into some type of asset that generates a return. It generates a return. It's going to generate cash flow in the future. Okay, so that's the context. Now let me talk about what a bond actually is. And then I'll try to get to as fast as possible how to value a bond so you get to the crux of the chapter. How to value a bond and what does a bond look like mechanically. So, in or, so it's going to take a few minutes to get there to value a bond. So let's look at what a bond is. A bond is long-term debt in which the borrower, the borrower is often called an issuer. And the issuer could be a company, uh, you know, a corporation, for example, it could be a municipality, it could be the U.S. government issuing treasury bills, it could be the city of Portland issuing a municipal bond, or the state of Maine issuing a, a bond. Um, and so uh, the, they're the issuers, and the uh, issuer agrees to pay, make payments of principal and interest on specific dates to the holders of the bond. So the investors of the bonds are the holders of the bonds. And they, the holders of the bonds are the ones who lend money to the company, or the issuer, basically. Okay, bonds are primarily traded in the over-the-counter market, and I'll show you an example of that from the Wall Street Journal. The over-the-counter market, there's no physical market. Um, you know, like when you watch TV and you, you um, they show you the New York Stock Exchange and people running around and it's quite crowded on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. That's a central physical location of an exchange. The over-the-counter market is a network of dealers. There's no central physical location. It's a network of dealers who post um, prices at which they're willing to buy and sell bonds. And so um, th that's where most bonds are traded, although some bonds do trade on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, most bonds are owned by and traded by large financial institutions, uh, 
and they're, they're, they're traded by financial institutions, but a lot of individuals own bonds indirectly through mutual funds and exchange-traded funds. And if you took Finance 327, Investment Management, you'd better understand uh, what, what that, how that works. Um, <clears throat> bond information is, is a bit harder to get than stock information. You know, stock information is readily available. If you have a ticker symbol, which is the three-letter, typically a three-letter symbol um, for a particular stock, which I'll, sh I'll show you in, in the next chapter, you, you can get information on IBM and Apple stock and, and Cisco and Whole Foods instantly with tons of data. But when it comes to bonds, it's a, it's a little more murkier. Individuals don't trade bonds like they do stocks. So there's a number of good websites to go to, which I'll, I can uh, show you later. But the main one I'll go to is the Wall Street Journal. You can go to Bloomberg.com. You can go to Finance.Yahoo. And you can actually go to the Treasury, the Treasury's website, which has a ton of information on, this, on um, Treasury bonds that the U.S. government issues. So now let's look at the key characteristics of bonds. Um, and this is important because the, the bonds are a little strange if you haven't run into them. You may have brushed on them, on them in accounting, but we're going to really hit hard in, in this chapter with bonds. So bonds have a par value. And that's what's often called the face amount. It's the amount that is paid at maturity. And it's assumed to be $1,000 in this course. And nearly every course um, will assume the par value to be $1,000. And so um, keep that in mind. Par value or face value, or sometimes called the maturity value, is $1,000. Now, a bond throws off, and I say throw off, generates cash flow. And the cash flow is called uh, a coupon. And that coupon is determined by a coupon interest rate, right? And that's a stated interest rate. It's usually fixed. <clears throat> so it's a, usually a fixed rate, for example, 10%. And um, in order to figure out the coupon interest each year, you're going to take the par value times the coupon rate. So if you have a par value of $1,000, like we're always going to have in this course, and the coupon rate is 10%, the bond will generate coupon interest income to the holder of $100 per year if you assume payments are made annually. Okay? Now, the bond will have a maturity date, and that's when the coupons stop being paid and when you get your return of your $1,000 initial investment. Bonds will have an issue date. That's the date they were initially, sometimes the, the, the language is called the bonds are floated uh, on the issue date. And then they're, re, they're retired sometimes at the maturity date is, is sometimes the language used. <clears throat> now, here's, here's the strange thing about bonds. We can issue a bond right now, and say we issue it at 10%. That's an exaggerated number. No interest rate really is, is 10% today, but it makes for easy calculations, and, and so you can visualize it better when it's a 10% rate than if it's a really small rate. So I, I use 10%. Um, so this rate, we, we issue a bond at 10%. That, bond, that interest rate, this coupon rate, is fixed for the life of the bond. So we could issue a 30-year bond or a 10-year or 20-year bond, and it's always going to pay 10%. Now, this 10% that we issue the bond at today is a function of today's interest rates. In, in theory, it would be a function of today's interest rates. But interest rates change minute by minute, day by day, and so... The value of this bond changes based on current market rates. If interest rates in the economy go up, all else being equal, this bond is less attractive because it's fixed at 10%. If interest rates in the economy decline in general, this bond becomes relatively more attractive because this rate is fixed at 10% and the market rates are falling. Okay. So now, the next term is called the yield to 
maturity. And the yield to maturity is the rate of return earned on the bond held to maturity, sometimes called the promised yield, although that's very misleading. But this yield to maturity is basically the going market interest rate for the bond. It is the R equals R star plus IP plus maturity risk premium plus liquidity premium plus default risk premium. Um, that concept that we studied, we just studied in the previous chapter, that's the yield to maturity. This interest rate, this whole interest rate here changes minute by minute depending on what real rates do, what people's expectations for inflation are, maturity risk premium, you know, how much liquidity is in the market and around that bond, and then the default risk, what's the probability of the company going to default. Constantly changes, so the yield to maturity changes, which means the value of this bond changes. Now, what we need to do is talk about how to value this bond. Okay? And that's where the next discussion here will come will go okay now recall I told you this a while back that the value of any asset is equal to the present value of its cash flows so here we have a timeline and we have cash flow one cash flow two so on, and then you have cash flow in, the last cash flow. And so we had, when we looked at time value of money in a previous chapter, we discounted all of these cash flows back. Discounted them at a particular interest rate. The, um, the math looks something like this. The present value equaled the cash flow. You can think of it this way, cash flow one plus R to the 1 plus the second cash flow, 1 plus r squared over, over 1 plus r squared, and so on. And so we summed all of that up, and that represented the present value of the asset, which is the fair value of the asset. Okay. Now, that is the value of any asset. But now we're talking about bonds. So let's apply this concept here, this whole concept, to bonds. So bonds have their own sort of terminology, and you know, like I just showed you, they have the, you know, the face value, the par value. They have the the um, coupon interest and maturity dates and all that stuff. So um, let's apply this to a, a bond, and I'm going to give it to you straight through an example. So here we have an example, and I'm going to ask, what is the value of a 10-year, 10% annual coupon bond if R, and sometimes in this, in this chapter, since we're dealing with debt, we specifically call it R with a little subscript D to say that, look, this is the interest rate for debt. This is, this interest rate right here, this is the yield to maturity. It's the going market rate. Okay, now let's value this. Okay, so our, our quest is, what is the value of this bond? And that's denoted as V with a capital B subscript. And so first, what you want to do is draw yourself a timeline like I did, like we did in previous chapters. Map out the cash flows. The bond is going to throw off 10% coupon. So that's going to be $1,000 par value, right? Because we're going to assume that the par value is always $1,000 here. Times 10% gives you $100. That's $100 each and every period, including the last period. And in the last period, you get your $1,000 principal back for the bond. Okay. How much is this bond going to cost you today? So you're going to buy a bond here, time zero, 
How much does that cost? Well, let's look at what you're going to get. You're going to get a hundred, a hundred, and a hundred for the next ten years plus a thousand dollars back. What is this worth today? What is the present value? So, you can do it mechanically, right? This way, where we have a ten percent interest rate here. This is this ten percent right here, plus a hundred, and you can keep doing that. And then the last two, the last cash flow would be 1100 divided by 1.10 to the tenth power. And if we did that, the value of this bond would be $1,000. Now, it's no coincidence that the bond has a par value of 1000 and its value, its price, is worth 1000 So here's what's going on. This bond generates 10% cash flow. It's fixed. Okay, Bonds are often called fixed income securities because these cash flows are fixed in time. You know exactly when you're going to get the cash flows and you know by how much you're going to get the cash flows, how much those cash flows are. So these are called fixed income. This is all fixed. What changes is this interest rate. We're saying at this point in time the market is demanding a 10% interest rate for this bond given its risk. Remember, this interest rate here is made up of R star plus the IP plus the maturity risk premium plus the default risk premium, blah, blah, blah. So given the risk of the bond and market interest rates, the market demands 10%. Well, this bond is generating exactly 10%. So this bond will trade the price of the bond in the market, trading over the counter, will be $1,000. And that's what we call at par. There, if the bond had, if market interest rates were lower, say eight percent, we'd be discounting at eight percent. Here, we would have a value that would be higher. Right? We would have a value that would be higher than a thousand dollars, and you can recalculate that, and we'll do that a little later. Um, You'll learn how to do that a little later. But you know from the time value of money idea that we did in the previous chapter that if interest rates fall, the present value will go up. So when interest rates fall to 8%, the value of this bond will go up to some number. I don't know, just off the top of my head, say $1,100. So if it goes up to $1,100, then this bond is trading at a $100 premium relative to its par value relative to par value. If interest rates go down, or up, I'm sorry, let's say they go up to 12%, that means the market wants this bond to generate 12%, but it only generates 10. It's not a very attractive bond. And so when the interest rate goes up, these interest rates go up, this whole fraction, each one of these fractions goes down, the value of the bond will go down, let's say it goes to $850. I didn't do the math, but I'm just guessing to make a point here. So when market interest rates go up, this bond becomes less attractive. When interest rates, market interest rates go down, this bond becomes more attractive, trades at a premium. And when interest rates go up, then the market demands a higher rate of return. This bond is not throwing it off. It's not generating it. And this bond will trade at a discount. So premiums and discounts are all relative to the par value of $1,000. Okay, now there's a couple of things that you need to get a handle on for um, actual calculations. Okay, first, how do we calculate the time value of how do we calculate the value of, bond, of a bond? Well, actually calculate the numbers, the whole thing. Well, we've done that in a previous chapter, and we could simply say the value of a bond equals payment So basically, the value of a bond is simply an annuity plus the $1,000 par value that you're getting back. So this thing will always be $1,000 on this end. 
And you can use a little D here, RD, if you want, as a subscript, just so you know that it, it's, it's the interest rate applied to this debt. So remember here, look, in the previous slide, this $100 is an annuity. So a bond is simply an annuity based on the coupon plus this $1,000 that you get back. So from a time value of money perspective, break it up into two pieces, an annuity plus the present value, the par value. Okay, now let's use a calculator to solve for this. So in this case, let's calculate the price of the bond. So um, you're going to hit 10 and then N. So hit 10 N, that's 10 periods, that's a 10 year bond. Then we're going to put in 10 I slash Y for the interest rate. Okay, and then we're going to hit um, we're, we're going to look for present value. So I'm going right across the top again. Um, you, get, you see this. I'm going right across the, the, this um, third row on my financial calculator. And so um, present value is what we're going to look for. The next thing I want to do is I'm going to input $1,000 for the payment. That's the annuity payment that's coming through the annuity component, and then I'm going to put in $1,000 face or future value. That's the maturity value. This is $1,000. It's a future value that you're getting at the end of the life of the bond. And then I'm going to say compute present value, and out will pop $1,000. It'll come out negative because, the, again, it's assuming that your calculator's thinking that you're going to invest $1,000 and give up $1,000 to get positive cash flow of $100 per year and a face value, which is a future value, um, 10 years from now. Okay, So you got to give something up to get something according to your calculator. So there you have it. Um, do press, press those buttons. Get your calculator out. Press those buttons. I'm doing it right now. And there you have it. I know you probably can't see it. It's there. There you go. It's the best I can show you here. Um, now, what happens if I change the interest rate? What if market interest rates, the yield to maturity, in other words, RD, and, and uh, I'm sorry that, that the world of finance and economics is all over the map in terms of terminology and uh, symbols. So if you go from one textbook to the next, and then you go to Wall Street and, and read the Wall Street Journal, and you go to um, the New York, New York Times, they're going to use different terminology. Um, the Wall Street Journal and New York Times won't have symbols, but textbooks will, and they'll have different symbols, different terminology. You just got to get used to it. So yield to maturity, RD, and the going market interest rate um, all mean the same thing. And let's say it goes, instead of 10%, here, we change this to 8%. Now, I told you, if interest rates go down, that means this bond should be more attractive. And again, the, the interpretation is this bond throws off 10%, that's 10% fixed. But interest rates have just dropped, and the market demands only 8% from this bond, but this bond generates 10%. This is an attractive bond. It should trade at a premium. So punch in 8% for I slash Y in your calculator and hit compute present value. And when I do that, I get a price of 1134.20. It comes out negative, but it's really positive. Right? 1134. That's a $134.20 premium. Why is it a premium? The bond's attractive. The bond throws off 10% coupons. As you can see right here, that's a 10% coupon. But the market only demands 8%. Now let's say interest rates suddenly spike up. The Fed increases interest rates. The bond market will drop significantly. Let's say exaggerated you know, 12% interest rate now. This bond still fixed at 10%. This guy is not changing. It's 10%. This bond will become less attractive because the market demands 12. It only throws off 10. So if I input 12, 
I slash Y, hit compute present, uh, present value, I get 886, um, oh, eight, eight, 887. $887. It trades at a discount of $113. Why? It's simply not an attractive bond. It's an unattractive bond because it only generates 10% instead of what the market wants, which is 12%. So that's the basics of, of valuing a bond. You can use this formula if you want, and you'll be able to recalculate all the numbers I just showed you. Now, let me show you the, the bullet curve, what I call the bullet graph. And this is what I mean by the bullet graph. I just showed you, cal I calculated bond values here, VB, I just calculated various bond values, um, and we can compare the bond value to the maturity in years. And so we're going to go kind of backwards in time. Um, so here is 10 years maturity, here is a 5 year maturity, and here is zero time left. So this is maturity on this axis, oops, oops, so this is maturity on this axis. And this is when it matures. That's the time left in the bond. So right now, we were looking at a 10-year bond. right? In five years, it'll only be a five-year bond. And in 10 years, it'll mature and it'll have this much time left. So we call this years to maturity. Yeah, you can call that years to maturity. Now, what's interesting about a bond is we ju I just showed you that if interest rates stayed at 10%, the bond will be priced at $1,000 because this bond, remember, the coupon was 10%. Okay? And the par, which is always $1,000, and it had an N of 10 years. Now, what's interesting is if interest rates somehow miraculously stay at 10%, this bond will be priced at $1,000 throughout its entire life. The price of the bond will not change. It'll stay at $1,000 because what the market is demanding, 10%, is what the bond is paying off, exactly 10%. The bond won't trade at a premium. It won't trade at a discount. It'll stick at $1,000. Now, I just showed you if interest rates go to 8%, the bond will be worth 887 Okay. Why was that again? Well, at 8%, the, the market only wants an 8% rate of return, but the bond throws off, oop, I'm sorry, 12%, 12% here. This, this, generated from, this was generated from 10%, this is generated from 12%. The market wants 12%. The bond is not very attractive because this bond only throws off 10%. So the bond will trade at a discount. But what, what happens is, what's interesting is, if rates remain unchanged, what will happen is this bond that you buy at 887, it's going to mature at this time right here. It's going to mature at $1,000. And so what will happen is this bond will creep up in value over time. It will creep up in value to $1,000 as it gets to maturity. So it'll, it'll gain in value. And we'll, you'll see that when you do various calculations. I mean, think about it. Right before the thing matures, you're going to get $1,000 right at this point. So what's the present value of $1,000 discounted at, at, at 12% for one day? It's just a little under $1,000. So um, you can see that as time goes on, this goes up. So what's going to happen is you're going to get a capital gain. So you're buying a bond at 887. You know it's going to mature at $1,000. You're going to get a $113 capital gain spread out over 10 years. Okay. Now, if you if interest rates are 8% the in the market, the yield to maturity is 8%, then the we calculated the bond to be worth 1134. $1134. 
Um, interest rates are low. The market only demands 8%. The bond throws off 10%. This bond is trading at a premium of $134. But no, notice, you're going to pay $1,134, but you know for sure that this bond will mature to $1,000 in 10 years. The value of this bond will start coming down like this. And there you got the graph of the bullet, what I call bullet curve, uh, shows up in the textbook. Um, and so what happens is you're going to have a capital loss on this bond. The cumulative capital loss is $134, but it's spread out over 10 years. Okay. So keep that in mind. You're going to have a capital gain and a capital loss. Those are going to be components of your total return, as I'll show you a little later. Actually, let me get to the components of total return from this information. Um, and and we'll, we'll, what we want to do is we want to dissect where is that total return coming from for, the, for these particular bonds. So we have one bond that with three different interest rates. And what we want to do is take a look at um, where, the, where the returns are coming from. Okay. Now, keep in mind that we had, um, we saw earlier that you have a return and it can be composed of two components, a capital gains yield plus um, a cash flow yield as we called it. Um, I'll call it cash flow yield here. Uh, but it's really a capital gain yield plus in this case it's going to be called a current yield for bonds. When we apply this formula for bonds you're going to have a capital gains yield and what's called a current yield. And this return is going to be the bond's yield to maturity, which is the same as RD, the thing that goes on the bottom when you, we discount with the cash flows. And that RD equals R star plus liquidity premium plus inflation premium, default risk premium, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to say, okay, if we know the yield to maturity, where, what's the source of that return? Is it coming from capital gains? Is it coming from current yield? I just got done showing you a graph that says, look, some of it's going to be coming from capital gains. And we know that some of it's going to be coming from coupon also because the bond generates cash flow. So as, a, as um, just to summarize what we had done earlier, we had looked at 10% um, coupon bond, right? When interest rates, so we're looking at a 10% coupon bond right now. That's the example. When yield to maturity is 10%, the bond was valued at $1,000. That was the first thing we did. Then I said, look, if it markets go, rates go up to 12%, the bond drops to 887. And if rates go down to 8%, the bond goes up and trades at a premium. That's what we just summarized. Now. Let's take a look at that information um, and use it to, to decompose. So let's decompose this guy right here, this, this 12%. What we're going to see is 12% here is for the yield to maturity. And so we have a capital gains yield, and we're going to have a current yield. The current yield is defined to be I'll write it down here. Current yield equals the annual coupon in dollars divided by the price of the bond. That's the cash flow that the bond throws off. The bond is throwing off, generating $100 in cash flow. The price of the bond was eight eighty-seven dollars even. Which means, look, we know the yield to maturity is 12%. That's the return that you're going to earn on the bond. This a small part of it, no, actually a large part of it, 11.1127, 11.27% is coming from the coupon, which means that 0.73% will come from capital gains for this bond. Okay. In other words, if you're looking here at this, the value of the bond, we started out right here at 887. 
what it says is over the next year, so we have 10 years of maturity through nine years of maturity, this bond will pick up in value about three quarters of a percent. Not very much. But that's why the line is basically flat here. The line is relatively flat. And as you get closer and closer, and I didn't draw this very well, but as you get closer and closer, it kind of ramps up at the end here for a bigger capital gain for any given period in this area or a bigger capital loss that the bond's trading at a premium. So 773 is the capital gain component. So here it is. The 12% is made up of an itty-bitty capital gain and nearly all coupon income from holding this bond over the next year. Over the next year, you expect, you expect, you hope to earn 12%, and it's going to come from a capital gain, and that's what you're expecting, and interest income. Now, from the coupon, let's verify that that, that number makes sense. And when we verify that, that this number makes sense, we'll have a little better intuition. So how do we know that the, the capital gain is going to be about three quarters of a percent? Well, we can compute that. Why don't we say, look, we, we, had, we started off with 10N, um, 12I slash Y to value this bond. We had payment, oh, $100 payment. We had a $1,000 face or future value and when we did that we computed price to be um, 887 even so why don't we just change this guy to nine years and see what the price of the bond is if we change it to nine years the price of the bond turns out to be 893.48 Four. You can't see that. 44. So let's figure out the capital gain. Well, it ended at 893.44 minus the 887. So we paid 887. It ends up at 893. So it gets a capital gain in dollars of about $6.44 divided by the 887. And that comes out to be 0 0.0073. Positive which is 0.73%. So there we just verified, we just verified how this capital gain comes about. We could have backed into it. So again, what I did was I backed into it here. I knew what the yield to maturity was. I knew what the current yield was with a quick calculation, and I backed into the capital gains yield. But I didn't have to back into the capital gains yield because I can figure it out by just changing the time horizon here, this bond, in one year from now, this bond will only have nine years left. I'm assuming interest rates remain unchanged. The cash flow of the bond has to remain unchanged. It's the fixed income security, and that's fixed. The new price of the bond one year from now will be 893. So that'll be a capital gain of three quarters of a percent. So if I could map this out and I could draw this better, and this is a horrible drawing, but this number right here is at 893.44, okay, right there. And, uh, and what you, you can do that each and every period, assuming interest rates are 12%, and you just decrease N. To the point where you decrease N, N equals zero, you're here, and the price of the bond will be $1,000. Boom, right at that point. You can try the same thing, experiment with the same thing for the 8%. And what the 8% is, you plug in the 8% here, you're going to have 100 over the price of 1134. You'll come up with a new current yield. Most of the yield will come from cash flow, again, from the coupon. And then you'll have a component here of capital gains. But it will be a negative. This number will be negative because the bond will have to depreciate in value. It's up, you're up here. It'll come down in value over time. It'll come down in value a little bit. So you'll calculate something, you know, I'm guessing at 1130, maybe 1129, you'll be at the nine year mark here. So you can try that at home. 
Okay, now what we want to do is we want to cover interest rate risk. And interest rate risk is, well, it basically says, you know, what happens to the price of a bond when interest rates change? Now remember, you know, interest rates change in the market, and we're looking at yield to maturity as being the interest rate, which is the same as R little d. And remember from the previous chapter, that's R star plus IP, inflation premium, plus a default risk premium, plus a maturity risk premium, plus a liquidity premium. And what we're saying is, look, any one of these guys can change in, at a given point in time, in any given second as you're watching the markets. And let's say inflation suddenly, people suddenly think inflation is going to start increasing in the future. Boom, this pops up. Your R, your interest rate or yield to maturity is going to pop up. Suddenly, if you, the economy is going into a recession and you think the probability, there's a slight increase in the probability of the bond going to the default, then um, the default risk premium goes up and then RD goes up and so on. And so, as you know, the value of the bond, of a bond, is and using some of the symbols in your, in your text, it's the interest payments each period. Right, discounted back. Right, plus da 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 plus the uh, basically um, interest plus face value or par value, discounted back in periods. Okay, so if interest rates go up, this R D goes up for every component here, RD goes up, each one of these fractions goes down, which means the value of the bond goes down. And if RD goes down, everything goes up. That's interest rate risk. Gyrating prices as a result of changing interest rates is called interest rate risk. Now what we want to do is we will want to look at interest rate risk from two angles. One is the level of RD or what we're, the yield to maturity. Okay, that's one we want to look at the level of interest rates basically in the market. And then the other is we want to look at the maturity of the bond and how that determines price risk. Okay, so two level of interest rates and maturity. So let me give you an example uh, of how that works um, looking at two different bonds. So we're going to look at a bond that has a 10% coupon bond that's a, a one-year bond, one year, and we're going to look at the change in the price, percentage change. Okay, and we're going to look at it from um, RD, the yield to maturity of 5%, 10%, and 15%. And then we're going to look at a 10-year bond, and we're going to look at the percentage change in the bond. Okay, so this will be um, the payments will be $100. It'll be a 10% coupon bond. You can write, see that 10% coupon bond. Two different maturities and obviously the par value or face value is $1,000 like, like always. And I'm changing the interest rates. Okay, that we're going to discount things by. So, you know from this graph that when interest rates remain unchanged, the bond, you know, if it's a 10% coupon bond and interest rates, the yield to maturity is 10%. It's going to stay 10% whether it's a one-year bond, right, or it's a 10-year bond. So, therefore, anchoring right here at this 10%, we know the value of the bond, a 10 or a one year bond, will be $1,000 because the bond generates 10% in coupon interest. The market demands 10%. So the bond trades exactly at par, no premium, no discount. Now, let's say, um, imagine interest rates falling by 500 basis points. Remember, a basis point is one hundredth of a percent. So that's from 10 to 5 is 500 basis point drop. You could calculate, just put n equals 1 um, in, the, in the i slash y of 5%, and your calculator will pop out 1,048. So 
If suddenly interest rates drop from 10 to 5% for a one-year bond, you're going to get a $48 capital gain, is what that's saying. That's plus 4.8%. Okay? Now, if interest rates suddenly from this 10% go up 500 basis points, the price of the bond will be 956, which is minus 4.4%. Okay. Now you can see um, you can see something right away. You can see that this the, the change is not symmetrical from a percentage basis, and that when interest rates are low, the level of interest rates there's more volatility in the price change. The price change will be larger. You can see that already. Okay. Now what you're also going to find is so that has to do with the level of interest rates that I was telling you about a minute ago. We want to look at level of rates and their effect on interest rate risk. So that tells you a level. Now comparing this column to this column, these columns here, the one year to the 10 year, we'll look to see how maturity impacts interest rate risk. So if you have a 10 year bond at 5%, that bond will be worth 1386, you know. Think about it. That look at that, it's a $386 premium. In other words, a 38.6% premium um, change in price. Because look, this bond is going to last 10 years, and it's the market only demands 5%. But this bond is generating this bond is generating a coupon of 10%. Ooh, that's an attractive bond. So the price of the bond will increase by nearly 40%. Now, if interest rates decline, uh, if interest rates go up to 15%, this bond is no longer attractive. It's an ugly looking bond because it only throws off 10% and the market wants 15%. So that'll be trading at a substantial discount of $251 or minus 25.1% drop in price from this, you know, starting out at this $1,000 point. So what do you see? Again, you see at the level of interest rates, when interest rates are low, bond price changes are big, which means the risk is larger when interest rates are low. But also notice, compare, just by changing maturity from a one year to a 10 year, you have substantial increases in price risk. Long term bonds are riskier than short term bonds. And you kind of know that intuitively. You lock your money up for 10 years, anything could happen. One year you're not too worried about. Um, and so here you also see when interest rates go up, you can lose a substantial amount of money. Now, we can graph that, this relationship, and it looks something like this, and it's an important, one of them, it's, it's kind of an important relationship to show. So here's yield to maturity here, and here is the, the price of the bond, price or what we're calling VB. Okay. What you're going to find is for long-term bonds, you're going to see this curved line. And so you can put, you know, here's the $1,000 mark that we started out with. And then this was 10%, right? And then um, when we dropped rates to 5%, we went all the way up to, and this is the 10-year bond. I'll put 10-year here. This was 1386 And when rates went to 15%, this was 749. Okay, so what we see here is, and I, it's not quite drawn the scale as much as I'd like it to be, but this 386 is larger than this 251 drop. And so this curved line is telling you as interest rates go this way, towards as interest rates go lower, Bond prices are more volatile. The slope of this line, which is negative, by the way, because when interest rates go up, bond prices go down and vice versa. The slope of this line is much steeper when interest rates are low. When interest rates are really high, changes in yield to maturity don't have big impacts on prices. We now are in an interest rate environment in, in the U.S. of interest rates being down here. They're really, really low. So we have the the chance when interest rates do change that there's going to be substantial price increase, um, actually price changes. And since interest rates are near zero, the only, the only place for them to go is up. 
when they go up, they're going to decline fast, is what this is saying. Um, now, com compare that now to, let me see if I can get a red pen here. Compare that to the one-year bond. The one-year bond, and we're going to anchor at the 1,000, right? So they're both equal at that point. The one-year bond looks something like this. And I'm, I'm trying to draw it with a little bit of curvature, but not very much. At the five-year mark, this was 5% mark. That was 1,048. At the 15% mark, it was um, 956 here. Okay. So what you see is this line is telling you, look, this line is a little ever so slightly steeper here um, when interest rates are low, which means you know it's ever so steeper than um, the 4.8 versus the 4.4. Um, and that the whole thing, because it's a one year, this is the one year bond, has much less volatility. So it's almost flat. So you can change interest rates and gyrate back and forth with interest rates and only a little price changes only little price changes. Compared to a 10-year, and you change interest rates a lot here, you're going up and down on this scale quite a bit. And if you had a 30-year security, you'd be even steeper. So I to get a blue pen here. You'd be even steeper and more curved with a 10-year bond, or a 30-year bond, if you would do the calculations. So 30-year bonds are substantially more riskier. The slope of the bond is steeper, and it gets especially steep when interest rates are low and you're on this, this end of the yield to maturity. Okay, now the next thing we want to cover is semi-annual interest payments. Nearly all bonds pay semi-annually. It's just the way the world works. We, I introduced, and the textbook introduces bonds from an annual perspective uh, because it's simpler. But in reality, bonds pay semi-annually, meaning the coupon payments get paid every six months. So the way to think about this is start off at time zero. You got year one, year two, year three, so on. And then you got period or year N at maturity. Okay. And so... Um, when we have when we had uh, annual payments, we had, for example, a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars, and then a hundred plus a thousand that was paid at the end. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to slice that one hundred dollars up into two fifty dollar slice fifty dollar amounts. So every six months, fifty dollars is being being paid. And so the last payment, which is n times 2, because you're going to have twice as many semi-annual periods, you're going to get $50 back plus 1000 So in order to deal with this, you, um, on, to value a semi-annual bond, you're going to take n years and multiply it by 2, and that's what you're going to plug into your calculator. So if we have a 10-year bond, it's going to be 10 times 2 is 20 semi-annual periods. Okay. Now, the other thing we have to do is if the, um, take the interest rate. Let's say that the interest rate, let's say RD, is 13%. Now, you have to keep in mind, like I specified and, and mentioned in the previous chapter, Time Value of Money, nearly all interest rates are disclosed on an annual basis. So if you have a 30-year bond, you don't get, they don't show you and disclose to you the 30-year, the cumulative 30-year return. They tell you, look, this bond earns 8% per year for 30 years. Uh, if you buy a three-month bond, they don't give you just that fraction of a year's return. That three-month bond yield is disclosed on an annual basis as if you owned the bond for an entire year, what would that interest rate be? Now, it's done that way so you can compare returns from one investment to the next. And that's just the way the, the market works. And so when you have interest rates, yields to maturity, 
in RD, it's always going to be disclosed on an annual basis. You're going to have to chop that in half to put it into your calculator for a semi-annual period. So if the, the market demands 13% per year, it's really 6.5% every six months. 6.5, 6.5%, so on. Okay, that's what you have to consider. Now, the other thing you have to deal with is, well, so um, the other thing, and I didn't, I didn't actually write it down, I'll write it down here, is that the payments, in other words, the coupons, are chopped in half. So you got to chop the coupons in half, and if it's a 10% coupon, that means it's 5% or $50 per period. So those are the adjustments. So if you plug this into your calculator, right, and you say N equals 20 and I slash Y equals 6.5 and payment equals 50 and future value, the face value here, it doesn't change. It has nothing to do with semi-annual or annual. So that stays at 1,000, right? And you go to compute present value, and that will pop 834.72. So this bond is worth $834.72. Now ask yourself, does it make sense? Um, well, the, the bond generates 10% in cash per year. The market wants 13%. And it's a 10-year bond, so this bond is not very attractive. It's going to trade at a discount. So whenever you do these calculations, always ask yourself, do my results make sense? If you got a premium here for the result and you got a bond that was worth $1,200, you know you did something wrong. And it's very easy to make a mistake pressing buttons on a calculator. So always ask yourself, intuitively, does my answer make sense? Now what we want to cover is yield, yield to call, YTC. We've talked about yield to maturity as being the promise interest rate that you, well, supposedly the promise interest rate that you get from buying the bond today times zero and having the thing mature at period N here. And so... Um, you have the yield to maturity covers this whole time period, which kind of makes sense. It's yield to the whole, till you hold it till it, it till uh, the the company redeems the bonds back. Now, in the real world, there's bonds are often callable, which means the company has the option to buy the bonds back early before they mature. Options are always valuable to the holder, so the company holds this option and it's written and spelled out in the indenture of a bond. A bond's indenture is the contract between the bondholders and the company issuing the bonds. Or who, the issuer could be a municipality or the state. It's the contract. It's a lengthy legal document that spells out the terms of the bonds and how interest is going to be paid and what the money is going to be used for and who the parties are involved and what happens if there's a default. It's all spelled out in, in that indenture. And the clauses around call will be discussed. What happened, there's usually a couple of things with respect to a call. Um, usually when companies issue bonds, they're non-callable for a period of time. So they issue the bond here at time zero. And maybe over the first uh, three years, say, the bond is non-callable, can't be called. And then maybe, you know, then you have the possibility after year three it can be called. So this is called a deferred call. So what it does is it protects the bond holder, the, the people who buy the bonds. So they don't buy a bond today and a month later the bond gets called. Or a year later the bond gets called. It's non-callable for, for a period. So the deferred is, the, the call is deferred for that time period. And after that it can be called at any time before maturity. Now, um, you might want to ask, well, why do companies have this option, and why is it valuable? Well, think about it. Um, let's use an exaggerated example here. Let's say the company issues bonds when interest rates are 15%. 
So it could be a municipality, could be a state, could be a company, a corporation issues bonds at 15%. Interest rates are really high, but they're desperate for money. So they pay the 15%. Um, what happens now if interest rates go up? Well, if interest rates go up, say to 20%, some outrageous number, the, the company's quite happy that it issued bonds at 15%. It's not going to call these bonds because why would it it'd be crazy to to buy back its bonds that pay fifth that it has to pay 15% interest expense on and then turn around and reissue bonds because when you buy bonds back you need the money to to get to be able to to buy the bonds back and why would you want to reissue bonds at 20% and increase your cost of capital by 5% that would be crazy nobody would do that that's kind of like getting a mortgage for 15% and then saying, ah, oh, you know, I want to refinance at 20%. Nobody does that. But what happens now? So that option is not have no value if interest rates go up. But what happens if interest rates go down to 10%? Ooh, now it, it becomes interesting. It's, it's attractive now to the company to buy back its, its bonds at, right, that pay 15% and reissue new bonds at 10%. So it just dropped its cost of capital by 5% over the whatever remaining life of the bond. Um, is when they issue, so they'll issue new bonds somewhere for a, a, a new maturity. Now, the question becomes, at what price do they buy the bonds back? What price do they call the bonds at? It's often par value plus one year's an annual interest payment, one year's worth of interest is usually what what the par or what what the callable price will be so the point is here is we can't calculate a yield to maturity when interest rates fall it becomes attractive for the company to to, to refinance the yield to maturity becomes almost irrelevant because the chances are the company is going to refinance it's going to call the bonds if it calls the bonds in a, at a certain period, the first, the minute it's callable, okay, the minute it's callable, the company's going to buy the bonds back for par value plus the annual interest, okay. So let's do an example of how this works. Here's the example: we got a 10-year semi-annual coupon bond. Right, its price now is one one three five ninety, and it's priced it's trading into premium. It's callable, let's say in four years. Four years it can be called for a price of one thousand fifty dollars. Okay, one thousand fifty because that's basically. Um, well, on a semi-annual basis, so go back to this, it's par value plus an annual interest payment if it's an annual bond. If it's a semi-annual bond, it'll be par value plus the semi-annual payment. Okay, so that's what we have here. Five years, uh, it'll be plus a semi-annual payment. So, we estimate the value of the bond right if we estimate the yield to maturity oops sorry if we estimate the yield to maturity of this bond where we have 20 semi-annual periods so n equals 20 present value is 1135 um, it's a 10 year yeah and then um, it matures for a thousand dollars so future value for maturity now would be a thousand the yield to maturity would be eight percent for this bond so let me write it out here. N would equal 20. Present value would equal minus 1135. Make sure you put it in as a minus because you have to buy the bond and then you're going to get payments back of um, $50 per semi-annual period, which is $100 per year. And then you have a face value 
of a thousand. So these are pluses here because this is the money you're going to get when you buy the bond. And so then when you compute yield in I slash Y, you're going to get 8% yield to maturity. But now what we're saying is the bond is callable in four years, which means eight, uh, N is now 8. It's not 20. Four years times 2 is 8 semi-annual periods. So N equals 8. Right? The price, we still buy the bond today at 1135 The payments are still $50. The, but we're not going to wait till it matures. So the future value, par value, is not 1000 anymore. It's 1050 right? So we're going to get our money back 1050 at year 4. So this is only a four-year horizon for this bond. And then we're going to say compute I slash Y. And when we do that, we will get 3.568, right? Um, but that's on a semi-annual basis, right? So you got to multiply it by 2, and you get 7.136. That is the yield to call on the bond specified on an annual basis. And by the way, when I did this, when you compute I slash Y, you're actually going to get 4% for a semi-annual semi yield to maturity, but you need to annualize it, multiply it by 2, and that's where I got the 8%. So here I got 3.58 on a 3.568 on a semi-annual. Multiply it by 2 to get it on an annual basis. And this is the yield to call on this bond. It's 7%. So it's really not the 8% that we thought. It's a, it's a little over 7 And one more thing about callable bonds. From the bondholder's perspective, callable bonds are not that attractive. Because it, what happens is when, when interest rates fall, the company is likely to call the bonds and they're going to give, and the company's going to give you the, your money back. You know, your par value, one thousand plus uh, a semi-annual interest payment or an annual interest payment, and you're going to get your money back at at a time when you you don't want your money back. Um, one, for for two reasons. One, you're going to get your money back at a time when interest rates are low, so you can reinvest that money at a very low interest rate. That's not a good time to reinvest your money. The other thing is. Those bonds may be trading in the open market at a price greater than the call price, in which case you're going to get a sudden capital loss. From the bonds could be trading at 1,400, and next thing you know they're callable at um, 1,050. You could have a capital loss. Now usually it won't happen to that extreme, because bondholders know that the bonds are subject to call. And so they won't increase the price too much above the call price, knowing that the bonds are possibly going to be called. So generally, callable bonds, the price will be limited. It won't go up that much. And if it does go above the call price, it won't be too much, and you won't sustain too much of a capital loss, but you still could get a capital loss. Now, let's cover another facet of bonds, and that's sinking fund provisions. Uh, this mainly applies to corporate bonds, and corporate bonds are subject to default risk. Uh, the, when, you, when you buy, if you were to buy a bond, say a 20-year bond, you don't know, uh, is the company going to be around to pay you back the money? Um, will it have the cash flow to, to pay you back? And so a, a lot of provisions show up in, in indentures. Indentures have provisions around sinking funds. And sinking funds are designed to reduce the, the default risk for a particular bond. So this is how it works. Basically it says, look, if a company issues a 20-year bond, it may require, the provisions in the indenture may require that 5% the, that of the bond be retired each year. Um, so that then the, the amount of burden on the, on the company declines over time to the point where at maturity it only has 5% of the original issue is, is due. And so these bonds are basically callable. And 
uh, and so there's two ways in which a, a company can buy back these bonds to fulfill the sinking fund provisions. One, it could arrange for a lottery, and every every bond has a serial number associated with it, um, it's called a QSIP, and so every bond could could have these serial numbers in which, um, you know, you randomly select bonds, uh, serials, and you call them, and you contact the bondholder, and you give them back their money. And the amount of money um, would be specified in the in the in the bond in the sinking fund provisions for the amount of the call. That's one way, just randomly selecting bonds and then buying them back. The other way is the company can go in the open market and buy those bonds back. And so it can go back into the open market, buy the bonds, you know, 5% of the bonds, and it would fulfill its sinking fund provisions. And then um, it would do that each and every year until the whole, the whole bond was um, retired. And that prevents basically balloon payments, because think about it. If a company borrows a billion dollars, takes in one billion dollars, pays the interest for 20 years, then 20 years, at the end of 20 years, it has a billion dollar balloon payment to make for that face value. That's a huge amount of money. So bondholders requ require or expect that the company to buy back some of those bonds, retire some of those bonds, and say 5% uh, per year over 20 years, and you'll have the whole bond will disappear in it by the end of 20 years. Okay, now I opened up the, the door to default risk, and let's go a little more into default risk. Um, default risk is primarily a concern of corporate bonds, but municipalities also have the potential to default, and um, I guess even possibly states, but I don't think we've ever had a state that defaulted. There's been a few municipalities that defaulted over time. Uh, and the U.S. government has no default risk. That's why when we covered treasuries, for example, we said the default risk premium was zero. So this is what we're talking about in this chapter. We're talking about the default risk premium, which mainly, uh, for the most part, applies to corporate bonds. Um, now, you should realize that there's various types of bonds out there. The, the bond, there's... there's there's a whole variety of bonds besides treasury bonds and corporate bonds and municipal bonds. Um, there are different types of bonds, and they have different types of default concerns, default risk. There are mortgage bonds out there. Mortgage bonds are bonds that are issued by companies that has pledge specific assets as collateral. So when you get a mortgage for a house, for example, the, the, those secure, your mortgage is is securitized. The bank makes sure that your house is security, your collateral for that loan that they're making you. Mortgage bonds are the same way. The company borrows money and it pledges, you know, a building, uh, some land, some property somewhere, and so there's specific assets pledged. And so, if there's default, you're going to have to seize those assets and liquidate them to get your money back. Okay. So there's also um, debentures. Debentures are unsecured. Okay, so here this is specific assets. Specific assets. And here is, these are unsecured for debentures. There's no liens. Um, there's no specific property on a debenture. So... Um, that means these things are risky in a sense that if the company goes in default, you don't have any specific claim on, an a, on a particular asset. Um, you're a general creditor at that point. You're in the pool with everybody else. And so that means that these guys are a bit more risky. There's also subordinated debentures. Subordinated debentures or means that they're inferior. They're... Um, Infer subordinated means that they're inferior, and they're inferior or subordinated below what's called superior or, or senior debt. Okay, so if you have debentures, they're unsecured, and then you have subordinated debentures, that means that, okay, not only are they unsecured, 
but they fall they're below more senior debentures, which means these are even riskier. So as I go down this list here, we're getting the default risk is going up. And then you have um, investment grade bonds. And investment grade bonds are triple B and higher. So triple B, and then you got uh, single A, which is higher, double A, which is better, triple A, which is better. Okay? So these are all investment grade. Anything below double or triple B, for example, junk, uh, anything below triple B are called junk bonds. Junk bonds are... Um, you go from double B down to CC, triple C, double C, single C, and so on. And you go down, X actually gets worse. This was getting better this way. This example, the way I laid it out is things are getting worse. You're, these are the highest grade junk bonds, double B. And as you get into the CCC, it's even worse. CC, worse. C, even lower. And then you eventually get D, which means you're totally in default. And so as, I, as we go down here, you get into the more, risk, more risky securities, more default risk. Okay. So now what, what factors affect default risk? Well, obviously it depends on the financial stability and perfa uh, financial performance of the company. Companies that are solid, in other words, they have a lot of cash flow. They have very little... Uh, uh, other debt. So if they have very little other outstanding debt, that means they're, they, you know, they, they haven't had needs to borrow money and they're probably doing better off. And not only that, if they do have a problem, they won't have to pay those other creditors off first and then you. And so you can look at debt ratios. For example, you can look at the amount of debt to assets. And uh, the less debt to assets, the better. Um, you can look at how much liquidity does the firm have? What is its current assets relative to its current liabilities, very, like the current ratio, and some liquidity ratios. So you want a lot of current assets, which means, think about it, the company has a lot of cash, accounts receivable, and inventory. All of this, the accounts receivable and inventory, can be turned into cash fairly quickly, minus you can think of divided or minus by your current liabilities, which are accounts payable um, and accrued and, um, and accruals, and um, you know salaries payable and things like that. So that you know if the company has a problem, it, it it'll have a low current ratio. It'll it won't have very much cash accounts receivable and inventory relative to these liabilities. So you want it to have a lot of current assets relative to current liabilities, which means the company has less risk. Okay. There's also, um, so that's the financial performance of the company affecting it, the default risk. Uh, th there's also contract provisions, like I said with the indenture. Contract provision, bond contract provisions or indentures can affect the, the default risk of the bond. And various contract provisions would be, are the bonds secured versus unsecured, as I talked about before? Okay. Um, are they senior versus subordinated, as I mentioned before? Those actually are the impact default risk, but because of the bond provisions. It's really independent of the financial performance of the company. And then you have um, other things that, that will affect default risk. Or are these bonds guaranteed or insured? Some bonds, oops, guaranteed or insured. Some bonds are actually insured by their companies. So it, if the company defaults on the bond, the bond will be paid off by another company. That's bond insurance. That costs bondholders a little bit of money to have those bonds insured. But it does make the bonds look a lot more attractive. 
There's also sinking fund provisions that we talked about. Sinking fund provisions reduce the default risk of the bond because the bond gets paid off earlier. And then, uh, you know, all else being equal, they'll shorter the maturity. The bonds are less risky. Longer maturity bonds are more likely to have more risk. Okay, let's cap off this, this chapter with some real data and we'll do some real calculations and recompute some real bond prices. Uh, first off, we'll take a look. I'm in the Wall Street Journal and I'm under Market Data Center and I'm under, as you can see here, bonds, bonds rates, and credit markets. <clears throat> and if you highlight that, you can see that there's all sorts of information on bonds and bond yields. And um, I specifically went into U.S. Treasury quotes Treasury notes and bonds, okay? And so here's the maturity. Here's a bunch of securities here in the maturities. Um, even bills are in here. And so take a look here, and you might want to keep this, this label, these, these headings in, the, in your mind, because they're going to, when I scroll down, they disappear. So here we have maturity on the left-hand side, right? Maturity. And we have coupons. Here's the coupon rate. Here's the bid price and the ask price. Now, these are quotes that come from dealers. Dealers are willing to pay the bid price and they sell at the asking price. And so the, and the other thing you have to realize is, and here's a funny convention, that bonds in the real world, even though they're priced at $1,000 and you have to write a check out for $1,000, their prices are based as a function of a hundred. So basically, they're moving every, the decimal to the left one place. And a thousand dollar bond is really quoted at a hundred. So meaning a hundred percent of par. And so that's what you see here. You see bid and ask prices as a percent of a hundred, basically. And, um, and you notice the bid is lower than the ask because the dealer buys at the bid and sells at the asking price. So you and I, if we were to buy bonds, we'd be paying, we'd be have to, we would have to pay the asking price, which is higher than the bid price. And the difference represents the dealer's profit for that bond. That covers their their cost of capital, you know, because they have to raise money to be able to buy the bonds, so they have to pay interest expense themselves. And they also have to uh, have cover their profits and risk that they're taking because treasury bonds, while they're default risk-free, there's still a risk the prices go up and down. See, right here, the change column shows you the prices going up and down. Okay. Uh, now, they also give you the asked yield. So when you have two different prices, a bid and an ask, you could have two different yields. But... The yield that's appropriate for us as an investor is the asked yield because we're going to be paying the asked price. So it's a function of the, the yield. The asked yield is what we're going to be earning. So let's take a look at what's going on here. Come down. Let's scroll down. So look at all these maturities. These are maturities, various coupons. You come down, you come down, and start out 2015. It goes all the way down for the next 30 years, down to um, 30 years from now, 2045. These are bonds that will mature 30 years from now. Down below here are treasury bills, so short-term stuff, very short-term. See, they only mature, they, all, they don't mature anything greater than uh, one year. So today, um, by the way, it's up here. T today is September 24th, 2015 when I'm doing this. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to take one of these bonds and look at the coupon, look at the maturity, look at the bid price, which is the price of the bond, the present value, and the asking yield, and see if I can recompute these numbers to see if they make sense. So what I want to do is pick an interesting bond. So I'm coming down here, and um, you know, I'm looking at most of these interest rates you can see are pretty low. But there are occasionally a few bonds out here that have really high coupons. I'm like, why, you know, why would they have high coupons? Well, because they were probably issued many years ago. So let's look at an example here. Scroll down. 
and I'm going to go to an example right here. I'll highlight it for you. Take a look at this bond. Matures in August 15th. Oh, no, I want to go to another one. Uh, this one. Sorry about that. This one. This bond matures in May 15th, 2021. It matures um, almost six years from now. In fact, um, in fact, May 15th of 2021 is 11.29 years. Okay, 11 point or 11.29 semi-annual periods is what I want to say. It's about almost six years. It's 11.29 semi-annual periods I just calculated that you know roughly roughly that's what it is but notice the coupon it's 8.125 holy mackerel that is a really high coupon in today's world how could that possibly be well it turns out that this bond most likely was issued 30 years ago back in 1991 when interest rates were in the 8% area and so this bond keeps paying that 8%. Remember, they're fixed income securities. It keeps paying that at 8%. And because it's paying 8%, which is well above current market rates, and the current market rates, by the way, are right here, the asking yield. Current market rates for a six-year security is about 1.6%. Now look at the premium these bonds are, are, are yielding. These bonds are priced at... Um, 135 which is really $1,350 per bond for the bid price. And it's $13.50 and 23 cents, and then it's $13.39. So it's really a few cent, few cent profit per bond for the dealer. Not very big. So now what I want to do is I want to reconfirm these numbers. Do these numbers make sense? The yield should determine the price here, and the price should determine the yield. So let's make sure that we've got this right. So I'm flipping over here to the pencil and paper, and i got to remember now the maturity was 5-15-21, and that is 11.29 semi-annual periods. Just under six years, because remember today, today, that I'm doing these calculations is September 24th, 2015. Okay, so it's 29.29 semi-annual periods, and the interest, the coupon was 8.125, and that's on an annual basis. Remember, coupons are always specified on an annual basis. The price of the bond, the bid price, from the dealer's perspective, was 135.0234, which really means the price was 1350.23. Um, the ask price, their asking price was 135.0391, which is 1,350.39. And the last, and so there was a small change in price um, that was on that last part of the video. And so the asking yield. was 1.603. So let's confirm this price. So if we put in N equals 11.29, and that's approximately how many semi-annual periods there are, and we specify I slash Y equal to 1.603 divided by 2, remember, in the real world, nearly all bonds are semi-annual, so I'm putting, I'm putting it in a semi-annual basis. 1.603, and uh, divide by 2, that's 0 0.8015 per semi-annual period. Um, the payment is $81.25. In other words, it's this number, 0 0.08125 times 1,000. Annually, that's 81.25 divided by 2. And the semi-annual payment is $40.62. The future value will be $1,000. Okay. 
And so we're going to hit compute present value. So let me get this into my calculator. Now, when I do that, I come up with 1350.66 cents. And that is really close. I'm within 27 cents of the real number. 27 cents, given it's $1,350, is not bad. And given the fact, oops, given the fact that um, I rounded this, I'm ballparking. It's about 11.29 years. It's about 11.2888 years. And so um, I'm pretty happy with that. I came up with a good estimate. So you see, a bond that has the a old bond that's still out there, it only has six years left. Um, it was originally a 30-year bond throwing off 8%, still throwing off 8%. It has a great, you know, a very high price. Most treasuries, by the way, are not callable. And so and in today's world, they're, none of them are callable. Years ago, some of them used to be callable, but they're not anymore. So this bond's got six more years. It's quite an attractive bond uh, for the next couple of years.